A very warm welcome to everybody. This is yet another session in our Dissecting Capitalism Season 2 webinar. And today we have with us uh, Professor Prabhat Patnayak. He is an economist. He needs no introduction, but uh, just to few the foreign uh, audiences who have joined us today, he is a professor emeritus at the GNU presently, where he taught since its inception. And um, he has a very illustrious career in economics. He is primarily a macroeconomist. And uh, his work has been published widely across various peer-reviewed journals. He writes very regularly in national dailies. And um, he is supposed to have very forthright and sharp views on where the world is headed today. And that's why we have him with us to discuss uh, the title of the session being neoliberalism and the abridgment of freedom. So without much ado, I hand over the screen to Professor Patnayak. The screen is yours, Professor. Well, thank you very much for having me for this session. It's my pleasure. The topic for the discussion is neoliberalism and the abridgment of freedom. Now, neoliberalism, essentially, in my view, refers to an economic regime in which there is relatively free flow of goods and services, commodities, and of capital, including above all finance across country borders. This was not always the case. As a matter of fact, under the Bretton Woods system that existed earlier, countries had actually put fairly severe capital controls and also they had fairly high tariff rates and even quantitative restrictions. Neoliberalism entails an abandonment of all those restrictions and of course, as I mentioned, relatively free flows of commodities and capital, especially finance, across country borders. Now, of course, starting very recently from the Obama administration in the US, and especially the Trump administration in the US, there have been somewhat greater restrictions on commodity flows. The United States, as you know, has put up tariff restrictions on imports from a number of places. But even though the restrictions on commodity flows have to a certain extent been reimposed, certainly by the leading capitalist country of the world, that's the US, the restrictions on capital flows, particularly financial flows, are never there. In other words, they simply have not been restricted. There are unrestricted capital, especially financial flows across country borders. And that, to my mind, constitutes the essence of neoliberalism. Now, if you have, therefore, finance that is moving freely across country borders, at the same time, countries are ruled by nation states, then we have a situation where globalized finance is confronting the nation state. Globalized finance capital is confronting nation states. Now, if this is a situation, in that case, the nation state willy-nilly has to obey the dictates of globalized finance. Otherwise, globalized finance would in fact leave the country's shores a mass resulting in a serious financial crisis. Therefore, what is sometimes referred to in polite circles as the confidence of investors has always got to be retained. And if that is the case, then governments have to pursue such policies and only such policies that retain the confidence of investors, which basically means that they satisfy the caprices of globalized finance. Now, this is a situation which actually rules out any active role on the part of the state in managing the economy as it would like to. As a matter of fact, John Maynard Keynes, the economist, 
economist who had advocated state intervention in demand management as a way out of the depression and as a way of stabilizing capitalism at a high level of employment in order to meet the communist challenge. John Maynard Keynes was thoroughly anti-communist, but he wanted capitalism, which he recognized as being afflicted by perennial mass unemployment to overcome this defect. Otherwise, he felt that the communists are going to win over the masses in capitalist countries. And to do that, he had suggested massive state intervention in demand management so that the state expenditure pushes the economy close to full employment. But he was aware that this is something which required control on the globalization of finance. Therefore, in an article he wrote in 1933, he had said, finance above all must be national. Because if finance is national, then there's a chance that the nation state would be able to control the national finance within its own boundaries. But because of the fact that that is not the case anymore, and neoliberalism is the regime for the first time where we confront this contradiction, uh, the nation state has to willy-nilly accept the dictates of globalized finance. Now, that itself amounts to a negation of democracy. Democracy basically means that the people, the electorate, has a choice between alternative agendas, that one political party may have one agenda, some other party has a different agenda, and the electorate, depending on its experience, actually chooses between these alternative agendas. But if it is the case that, 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 that because of the dictates of finance, all political parties are more or less scared into having the same economic agenda, that which reflects the caprices of globalized finance, then there's no choice. In, in, in India, for instance, you have had the Congress government, the United Front government headed by Mr. Devi Gorda, you have had Mr. Gujarat's government, you now have the BJP government, they all have the same economic agenda. I mean, they may make all kinds of different rhetoric, but fundamentally their agenda is exactly the same. Therefore, that in a sense amounts to, in a basic way, a negation of democracy. If by chance some political formation espouses a different agenda, in that case, long before a different agenda, different from what globalized finance dictates, then long before such a political formation comes to power, there would be an exodus of finance. And if there is an exodus of finance, then that party is going to face the charge during the election campaign. Look, these fellows, even before they have come to power, there is a huge outflow of finance imagine how bad the situation would be if they did come to power. As a result, political formations that actually dare to espouse a different agenda abandon it well in time in order to fall in line. And if by chance one of them does not abandon it, but before the elections and actually does go through with it and even wins the elections, then after the election, they compromise on it because they would not dare to invite a crisis for the economy. That, for instance, is what happened to the Greek leftist group, Syriza, which actually formed a government. And Syriza's problem is that it actually said that we are going to do something very different from all for all our preceding political governments. But when they came to power, they found that their hands were so badly tied that they actually had to fall in line. Therefore, you either betray your ideology and agenda before the elections, or you betray your ideology and agenda after the elections. But fundamentally, you do something as long as you're caught within the web of globalized finance, you do things exactly as globalized finance would like. Now, this is something which therefore implies that there is a complete inversion of what we take to be democracy. We take democracy to mean the sovereignty of the people. 
But on the other hand, what you have here is the sovereignty of globalized finance, of international finance capital, which replaces the sovereignty of the people. Therefore, in a very obvious and clear sense, there is an abridgment of freedom that is entailed in a neoliberal regime. But of course, you may argue, some people may argue that, look, there is no difference between this, that the interests of finance and the interests of the people are exactly the same. That basically, if you have a regime that is sympathetic to international finance capital, that retains the confidence of investors, in that case, not only would finance come in, financing their thereby whatever trade deficits you have, current account deficits you have on the balance of payments. But what is more, you'd also be able to draw long-term investment that will come and set up factories here. Therefore, you'll have a high rate of growth. And with a high rate of growth, people are going to benefit. Therefore, there is no contradiction, they would argue, between catering to the caprices of globalized finance, including and more generally globalized capital, and of course, respecting the sovereignty of the people, looking after the interests of the people. Now, this assertion is completely wrong. And I, 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 I would like to take some time showing why it is completely wrong. The point is that among the various things that globalized finance insists upon is, of course, a withdrawal of the state from supporting what I'd call petty production, of which the biggest example is peasant agriculture. That the peasant agriculture gets thrown to encroachments by big capital, as indeed other kinds of petty production are thrown uh, to encroachment by big capital. Earlier, you may remember, in the Nehruvian dirigist, what I call the dirigist regime, the state protected in very many ways petty production. You know, capitalism destroys petty production because petty production typically would find it difficult to compete with the capitalist sector. But it survives, it, it thrives because of the support of the state. And that is the, the situation that prevailed in our country prior to neoliberalism. Peasant agriculture was supported by the state in very many different ways, which everybody is familiar with. You had, for instance, subsidized inputs, including above bank after bank nationalization, the subsidized credit that was given to uh, the, 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 the peasantry. You had assured minimum support prices. You had procurement operations by uh, various government agencies in the case of 22 crops. You, I mean, these were mainly food grain crops. Even for cash crops, you had the various commodity boards, tea board, coffee board, coir board, coconut, I mean, etc., uh, which actually uh, intervened when there was a price fall. So you had, in and, and you had government uh, establishments, research establishments undertaking uh, research and development work relating to agriculture, the results of, the, of, of, of such research were made available to the peasantry through an extension system that was the biggest in the world. I mean, it was made freely available to the peasantry through extension services, the like of which India had never seen before, and the like of which no other country in the world has to this day. So, so you had this support of the state for the petty production sector, in particular for peasant agriculture. Now, one of the things that happens with neoliberalism, and this is one of the dictates of globalized finance, is that state support from petty production, especially from peasant agriculture, is withdrawn. Now, we know in India, for instance, any kind of support as far as the cash crops are concerned, in terms of price support, has been withdrawn. The tea board, coffee board, rubber board, coin board, all those boards continue to exist, but they do no longer have a marketing function. That means in years of price crashes, they do not go to the market to provide a floor to which the price can fall. 
Therefore, many of the cash crop growing peasants have been exposed to acute hardships, especially because the other means of supporting the peasantry, namely having tariff protection against world market price fluctuations, quantitative restrictions against world market price fluctuations have all been withdrawn withdrawn under the WTO, even before WTO, the Indian government had withdrawn that, that kind of protection. Therefore, the world market price fluctuations manifest themselves in the Indian economy as well. And certainly when it comes to cash crop, therefore many of the cash crop growers have been exposed to extreme distress because as you know, in the world market, these fluctuations are very high amplitudes because of which there have been a spate of suicides. I'm not saying suicides have been confined only to cash crop growers, but predominantly when you look at the person, the peasants who have committed suicide, a lot of them have been cash crop growers because to grow cash crops, you require credit, you take credit credit from the banks or you take credit from some private agency and of course when you find that the prices have crashed you can't pay back the credit and therefore many peasants lakhs of them have committed suicide in addition very recently for instance the modi government had three farm laws against which there was a year-long peasant agitation which was going to withdraw this kind of support from food grains as well but the government finally caved in, though it has not abandoned the project of, of, of withdrawing the support that continues to be on the cards, but at least the government for the time being has uh, taken a step backwards. Now, the point is that would also expose the food crop growers to the world market price fluctuations and therefore uh, uh, the distress uh, which has been essentially uh, which has been essentially concentrated till now among cash crop growers would in fact spread across uh, to food grain growers as well but even for food grain growers what has actually happened is that since the subsidies on inputs have got reduced in fact you know for budgetary purposes because the fiscal deficit cannot exceed three percent of the central government central government's fiscal deficit cannot exceed three percent of the gdp state governments cannot exceed another three percent of the gdp because of this fiscal bind a lot of the subsidies on inputs have been whittled down a lot of the subsidies of credit have become irrelevant because of the fact that many of the nationalized banks these days don't actually give credit to the peasants because the definition of, 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 of agricultural credit has been so widened that if you buy a scooter in a rural area, then that too is counted as agricultural credit. So because they don't get credit from institutional agencies, many peasants have gone to uh, private money lenders who in turn charge exorbitant interest rates. Therefore, input prices have gone up, but output prices have not gone up exactly in the same proportion, which has resulted in a squeeze as far as the profitability of peasant agriculture is concerned. This squeeze in turn has basically meant that the peasantry has found it difficult to make ends meet. Many of them have left agriculture altogether, quite apart from those who have committed suicide. Many have left agriculture altogether. In India, for instance, between the 1991 census, when we embarked on the neoliberal path, and the 2011 census, the last one for which we have data, 15 million cultivators ceased to be cultivators. Cultivator is a census category. They ceased to be cultivators. Some of them perhaps became agricultural laborers, other migrated to cities. When distressed peasants, migrate to cities in search of jobs. It's not as if jobs are waiting for them in cities. On the contrary, another very important feature of the neoliberal economy is that because all sectors are now exposed to foreign trade, therefore they have to survive by introducing technological change. And if that is the case, then there is, there is a pressure to introduce technological change, which raises labor productivity. 
Now, the rate of growth of employment in any economy, this is just an algebraic truism, is the rate of growth of GDP minus the rate of growth of employment. Now, the rate of growth of employment, uh, sorry, minus the rate of growth of labor productivity, rate of growth of employment is equal to rate of growth of GDP minus the rate of growth of labor productivity. Now, if it is the case that technological progress is now quite rampant, it becomes necessary because of the competitive environment in which Indian producers have to face competition from foreign producers because of the free flow of commodities, then you find that the rate of technological progress typically which raises labor productivity gets accelerated when that happens the rate of employment falls as a matter of fact in india i i keep giving information data from india with which i'm familiar even though gdp growth rate apparently reportedly doubled compared to what it was before Employment growth rate halved from about 2% per annum earlier to about 1% per annum during the neoliberal period. Therefore, even though you may have an 8% rate of growth of GDP, if you have a 7% rate of growth of labor productivity, you just have a 1% rate of growth of uh, employment. This is, imagine an economy in which there is 1% rate of growth of employment. In such an economy, what you find is that the labor reserves, the, un the reserves of unemployment and underemployment would also would, would be actually growing because the population and the workforce is growing at more than 1%. If employment opportunities grow at only 1%, that means the labor reserves are growing. If labor reserves are growing, then of course it weakens the bargaining strength of all working people, including even organized workers. In fact, organized workers in India have been witnessing a casual, increasing casualization, and therefore it actually saps their bargaining strength. When that happens, their real wages cannot increase. But labor productivity is rising, as I said. Therefore, there is a tremendous increase in the gap between labor productivity and the real income of the working people, a gap which economists sometimes refer to as the economic surplus. The share of the economic surplus increases dramatically during this period. Now, if the share of the economic surplus increases, that of course basically means that income inequalities increase quite dramatically, that basically those living off the surplus become better off, while those living off uh, income from work become worse off. Not only they become worse off relatively, but as a matter of fact, they become worse off absolutely. If the workforce is growing at 1.5%, at, at and employment opportunities are growing at, at 1%, then obviously maybe the same amount of work is being distributed among more workers, which means that everybody's work and everybody's income is actually reducing and reducing. Therefore, neoliberalism, no matter how high a growth rate it achieves for the country, necessarily means at least in large economies like India, where there's a significant peasant population, it, it necessarily means uh, not only a rise in the share of surplus, but an absolute impoverishment of the working population. Now, there are some in data on this as far as the Indian economy is concerned. One way of looking at absolute impoverishment is to see the nutritional levels of the people. In India, when poverty studies first began, anybody in rural India who did not have access to 2200 calories per person per day was considered poor. Anybody in urban India who did not have access to 2100 calories per person per day was considered poor. Now, suppose we take those benchmarks. In that case, you find that the proportion of the rural population that actually did not have access to 2200 calories per person per day was 58% in 1993-4. A 
roughly around the time that neoliberalism was introduced into India. This proportion had increased to 68% in 2011 12, the last national sample survey year for which we have data. For urban areas, this proportion had increased from 57% of the earlier date to 65%. Therefore, even though GDP has been growing more rapidly, apparently, reportedly, the magnitude of poverty actually has increased. So to say that the interests of finance, the interests of globalized finance, the interests of globalized capital more generally, are coterminous with the interests of the people is essentially fundamentally false. That being the case, the abridgment of freedom that I talked about, which arises because of the fact that the sovereignty of the people is replaced by the sovereignty of international finance capital, is an abridgment which is not just formal, it's an abridgment which is absolutely real. It's, 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 it's a very, very real substantial abridgment because the people not only lose their political ability to influence events, but they actually get impoverished by this entire process about which they can do nothing. Why do I, do I say that they can do nothing? One can actually say that, all right, if this is something which happens because of the fact that the economy is caught within a web of neoliberalism, then maybe you, the country should, should get out of neoliberalism then all right, then, then some political formation should actually give the slogan that the country should get out of neoliberalism. But the amazing thing is that delinking an economy from neoliberalism is extremely difficult. Because, of course, your big capitalists or, or even significant sections of the middle class are beneficiaries of the neoliberal order and therefore they would oppose any delinking from neoliberalism. On the other hand, the working population, the workers, the peasants, the petty producers, the craftsmen, the fishermen, the agricultural laborers, all of them who are being squeezed by the neoliberal regime would actually find that if they elect an alternative government that wants to delink itself from neoliberalism, then firstly, of course, the government must retain their support. But more importantly, as I said, the government would be faced with capital flight. But suppose the government still goes ahead and puts some capital controls so that capital flight is stemmed. In that case, you'd find that, cap that finance would cease to come into the country. That finance, if it is not allowed to go out, at its own sweet will would obviously not come into the country. If it doesn't come into the country, in that case, it becomes difficult for the country to finance its trade deficit. You know, India, like many third world countries, imports more than it, ex than it exports. That being the case, this can be sustained only if there is some flow of finance that actually uh, enables us to bridge this gap. If there is no flow of finance, then we can't support this gap. And that being the case, then some trade controls would, be, would, would have to be imposed. When trade controls are imposed, then of course, imports are curtailed. When imports are curtailed, then this is also likely to hurt the very people who had supported such a political formation in its agenda of delinking from globalization. Therefore, you find that any political regime that wishes to be linked from globalization would first of all have to mobilize the support of, 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 of the working people. And what is more, it has to retain the support of the working people, even in a situation where the conditions of the working people uh, actually become worse over time because of the non-availability of this finance. You know? So, so that, that being the case, fairly soon such a government would actually lose its support and would be thrown out. But suppose even that does not happen, then we know that all leading advanced countries 
are countries that are behind globalized finance, that are behind the neoliberal regime, and then they would start imposing sanctions upon the country in question, saying that this is a rogue state. And as a result, you find that even such exports the country was making, it would not be able to make. Therefore, its economy would be in a shambles. Therefore, the extreme hardships are entailed in the process of delinking from globalization. Therefore, all I'm trying to say is that globalization puts you in a situation where, on the one hand, there's no easy exit for it. On the other hand, if there is no exit, then the people become poorer and poorer over time. And of course, they lose their democratic rights over time. They, 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 they lose their political uh, uh, sovereignty over time. Therefore, it's a situation which is like a no exit situation, except at great hardships and great sacrifice on the part of the people for which of course they have to be prepared if they are going to get out of this. But that is not all. I believe that globalization or this entire neoliberal regime has now reached a dead end. Why do I believe that? I believe that because, as I mentioned, in every country that is experiencing this process of globalization, of neoliberalism, which is basically the regime of uh, globalization of finance capital, you find that inequalities have been increasing because surplus is rising. Surplus, the share of surplus is rising within every country and is rising overall in the world economy. Now, a rupee that is given to a working man would be largely consumed by the person. But if the same rupee is given to a surplus earner, someone who is better off, then some of it would be put in the pocket for future spending, which is what economists call saving. Therefore, the propensity to consume out of a rupee at the margin is much higher for the working person than it is for the surplus earners. Every redistribution of this kind, therefore, gives rise to a reduction in consumption demand. And if it gives rise to a reduction in consumption demand, it would also give rise over time to a reduction in investment expenditures. Therefore, there would be a tendency towards stagnation, recession, overproduction crisis, what economists would call crisis of overproduction. This is something which has been happening, except for the fact that this crisis of overproduction was camouflaged was, was contained by a very interesting phenomenon, which is the asset price bubbles in the United States. In the United States, you had in the 90s, uh, something called the dot-com bubble, which basically meant the share prices of dot-com companies went up. And when the dot-com bubble collapsed, you had a housing bubble, which collapsed in 2008. Now, what is a bubble? A bubble is one in which the price of an asset shoots up, having nothing to do with its real intrinsic value. It shoots up for entirely speculative activities. If a, if, if, if a factory whose price is 100 rupees actually has equities, which actually give it a value of 800 rupees. Why does anybody buy, buy that equity? Because that person thinks that by buying the factory for 800 rupees, tomorrow that person can sell the same equity for 820 rupees or 850 rupees. So that's why it's a bubble that basically prices rise because people buy the asset at inflated prices in the hope of selling it at still higher inflated prices and these prices have nothing to do with the actual worth or the actual earnings from that factory or from that particular asset but of course when you have such an asset price bubble if i have an asset whose value in the market is 800 rupees not 100 rupees, which is the intrinsic value, authentic value, but 800 rupees, because that's the price at which I purchase. And I hope to sell it, unless the price crashes before my buying and selling. I hope to sell it for 850 rupees. Then I find that my wealth has gone up.
if my wealth has gone up, then I consume more, I spend more, I buy a villa, I buy a car, I, and so on and so forth. So there's a wealth effect on consumption because of which there is some stimulus. The United States had the stimulus and the US being the biggest economy in the world, it actually gave a boom as far as the world is concerned. Now these are booms stimulated by asset price bubbles. But after the collapse of the housing bubble, there has been no comparative bubble because people naturally get more scared. When the housing bubble collapsed, almost the entire financial system in the US uh, was on the verge of collapse. It was sustained by $13 trillion, which the Obama administration pledged in order to sustain it. So the point is that, you know, that, that, that bubbles cannot be made to order. And what is more, after the collapse of every, any particular bubble, the next bubble becomes even more difficult to generate. Therefore, given the tendency towards overproduction, the offsetting factors for this overproduction are become less and less. The other offsetting factor, of course, is state expenditure. But state expenditure is something which, in order to effectively boost demand, has to be financed either through a fiscal deficit, in which case the state is spending, let us say, 100 rupees without taxing anybody. It is simply spending it by printing notes, let us say, in which case no taxation of anybody is a pure net additional demand. Alternatively, if the state is taxing the rich who spend a part of their incomes but save the other part, suppose they were spending 50 rupees out of their 100 rupees of income and saving 50 rupees, the state taxes away this 100 and spends it all, then that means there's a net addition of demand of 50 rupees. Okay, So that being the case, that you find that, that state addition to demand is something which would occur only if state spending in finance either by a fiscal deficit or by taxes on the rich, whether it's income, corporate income tax or, or a wealth tax or whatever. Now, both these are anathema as far as globalized finance is concerned. Of course, globalized finance does not want taxation of the rich because that would mean paying taxes itself, higher taxes, and it does not like fiscal deficits uh, by the state because that would basically mean it's a delegitimization of, of capitalism if the state undertakes larger expenditures to generate employment. Therefore, globalized finance is opposed to both these ways of financing, which is why the state can no longer become a factor countering the tendency towards overproduction. So because of that, you now have a situation where neoliberalism is pushing the entire world economy towards stagnation. And mind you, this has nothing to do with either the pandemic or with the Ukraine war or with the current inflation. This was happening even before. So neoliberalism was pushing the world towards stagnation and recession. But there was no possible way of counteracting this because the only counteracting mechanisms which can be state expenditure is something which uh, uh, is anathema as far as globalized finance is concerned. So the neoliberal regime is really moving towards a dead end. It has actually reached a dead end, which is why unemployment in India was growing even before 2000. Uh, 20, I mean, you know, even before the lockdown, it was growing even when you compare 2019 with all, all with the entire preceding period, it was growing. So it was higher than the preceding 45 years, the unemployment rate in India in 2019. So because of this, neoliberalism is running into a dead end. When neoliberalism runs into a dead end and nothing can be done by the state, then to preserve itself against the anger of the people, neoliberalism enters into an alliance with neo-fascism. This is not just in India, this is everywhere. 
In fact, this is true in Turkey, this is true in Poland, this is true in Hungary, this is true in, in, in Brazil. This was even true in the United States when, when, when Trump was there. You know, that, that neoliberalism entered an alliance with neo-fascism. Neo-fascist movements come up. Some of them are successful in capturing power, like the countries I've been talking about. Some are not yet successful, like in France, Marine Le Pen contested for the election, uh, for the presidential elections lost. Similarly, in Germany, there is AFD, which is a fascist outfit that gets a fair amount of votes, but nowhere yet near power. Similarly, in Britain, the UKIP is, is pretty close. I mean, it's, it's a fascist outfit. It has got a fair amount of votes, but on the other hand, it is not in power. So you find that in some countries, neo-fascism is in power. In other countries, neo-fascism is not in power, but everywhere it is growing. Why is it growing? It is growing because of the support of globalized finance, particularly of the corporate oligarchy that is that is integrated with globalized finance. This is something which is clearly visible. Corporate oligarchy supports the neo-fascist elements by providing them with funds, by providing them with media support, by, by helping them in very many ways. This is something which has always been a feature of fascism, even in the 1930s and now. What fascism does is that it actually, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it picks up a hapless minority group as the other. It actually puts the blame of society on this hapless minority group. It could be Muslims, it could be the Blacks, it could be immigrants, it could be an ethnic minority, religious minority, etc. Et, et a racial minority. So it always picks up, uh, Hitler had picked on the, on, on, the, on the Jews, it picks up on some hapless minority group, projects it as the source of all evil, and therefore what it does is that it changes the discourse altogether. So on the one hand, fascism entails authoritarianism, because any critics are, are, are victimized. On, on the other hand, fascism also changes the discourse. The discourse is no longer about bread and butter issues. Discourse is about we have been humiliated in the, in the, in the 15th century and so on. So, so the discourse shift. And the shift in discourse is something which actually helps neoliberalism, notwithstanding its inability to cope with the crisis, notwithstanding its inability to provide relief to the people, to retain its political hegemony. There are a couple of other important features of neoliberalism, of, of, of neofascism, which I would like to draw your attention to. You see, because neofascism is not the same as any bread and butter authoritarianism. Bread and butter authoritarianism, like we saw during the emergency, has is authoritarian. It uses the organs of the state against dissidents, against the opposition. But under neo-fascism, not only does that happen, but there is an ideology, ideological attack on the hapless group. But at the same time, there is a very close relationship between the elements of monopoly capital and, of course, the neo-fascist elements. In fact, I have called in the Indian context a corporate Hindutva alliance, the neoliberal neo-fascist alliance in India takes the form of a corporate Hindutva alliance. And lastly, what, what neo-fascism does is that it actually relies not only on the organs of the state for repression, but also on street hoodlums, on, 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 on people who owe allegiance to it and who therefore constitute, as it were, the, the, the kind of, you know, roving uh, supporters who, who, who are vigilante groups. This was true in Italy, this was true in Germany, this is true everywhere. Vigilante groups who also uh, 
terrorize repress opponents. Therefore, neoliberalism, even when it comes to a dead end, abridges freedom by forming an alliance with neo-fascism. The difference between neo between classical fascism of the 30s and neo-fascism of today is that classical fascism, at least because it was not globalized finance facing the nation state, classical fascism at least had generated employment through military expenditures. The government, Hitler spent a lot of military, uh, you know, rearmament. The Japanese spent a lot of rearmament. They got out of the, of the Great Depression well, by spending on rearmament. Now, the point is that contemporary fascism, neo-fascism, for reasons I have just discussed, is incapable of providing even that relief, because of which it may, because after all, it is retaining the shell of democracy. It may even get voted out of power. That may not happen. That probably will not happen, but it could happen. But even when it gets voted out of power, it will continue to remain on the political platform and can make a comeback. So we really are seeing a period of protracted neo-fascism because of the fact that the current conjuncture which is one of neoliberal crisis, provides the soil for its growth. If neo-fascism is to be defeated, then we have to go beyond neoliberalism, for which, as I said, the people have to be mobilized and have to be willing to make great sacrifices for delinking from the existing neoliberal world order. Thank you, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Patnik, for this wonderful lecture. Now I will open the floor for Q&A. Um, please uh, raise your hand or, yeah. Uh, usually, if nobody is asking, I ask the first question, but OK, I, I will do it. I, I will do Whatever you have presented so far, I completely agree with you. Just to make things a little bit more interesting. I want to um, challenge this discussion a little bit. First is on the nature of capital. From the time when the uh, Industrial Revolution took place in England and, <clears throat> and Europe and elsewhere, the capital has been moving boundaries. Uh, for example, um, finance was flying from UK to uh, Americas to use in sugarcane production and uh, slavery. Later on, the finance came to also to finance um, Hitler and so on and so forth. So the capital hasn't really changed its nature after the uh, mechanization, industrialization that we have heard uh, in the writings of Marx. So I was wondering if there is something new in the nature of capital that has changed. That's why we're calling it neoliberal because it's doing the same thing. Whoever comes to power, they go and give more money. Okay, you are more powerful. We will negotiate, make a deal. It's good for you, good for me. Can you please uh, explore this? Yes, uh, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very good question. Uh, I, 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 I could not deal with it during the limited time I had. You see, there was always, always mobility of capital from Britain, first to Europe, then to the United States, and generally to the temperate regions of white settlement. That basically British capital went to the United States, it went to Canada, it went to Australia, it went to New Zealand and so on. So along with the shift of the European population to the temperate regions of the world, they didn't come and settle down in the tropics in any large numbers. Along with the shift of the European population to the temperate regions of the world, there was also a shift of capital from Europe, primarily from Britain, but also from France and so on, to these very regions, which is why capitalism got diffused, and which is why the industrial capitalism spread from from Britain to Europe, Europe to United States, and so on and so forth. Now, during that very period, what was happening to the colonies, what was happening to the tropical regions of the world, which were actually part of, 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 of the colonial uh, empire, that, that in the colonies, not only did very little capital come, it, it, it came to plantations, 
it came to mines, it came, in other words, to regions where which were which were complementary to the international division of labor, where the third world or the, or the tropical region, much of the third world is in the tropics, was actually producing primary commodities, while the first world was producing manufactured goods. But the idea of capital coming to the third world in order to locate itself in the third world for producing for the world market did not happen for producing manufactured goods for the world market. If that had happened, then the British cotton textile industry would have shifted a mass from Manchester to Bombay. But, but that did not happen. On the contrary, what you had was a sucking out of the surplus from these colonies, which actually went to finance the capital that was going to the temperate regions of white settlement. So the colonies, far from receiving capital, were actually gifting capital to the metropolis in, in, in order to invest elsewhere. They're gifting capital uh, through what Indian nationalist writers call the drain of wealth. Now, if you look at some figures that in the entire colonial period, the magnitude, the proportion of British capital investment that occurred in India was just about 10%. Okay. just about 10%. And that too, as I said, in producing uh, tea plantations, in producing kind of, you know, mineral wealth, in producing, and so on. Uh, in, in other words, in ways which were, um, which were, which were uh, complementary to the international division of labor. What neoliberalism has done is that it has actually opened up it has actually opened up these countries precisely because capital was not coming in, precisely because drain was occurring. After decolonization, we actually had regimes like the Nehruvian regime and so on that really protected themselves, delinked themselves from, from that kind of an earlier network of relations and did industrialization behind protectionist walls. Now, what neoliberalism has done is to break down the protectionist walls to say that, look, you don't need all this protection. Capital is now going to flow into your countries. And some capital has indeed flown in, in, into these countries. Uh, certainly, not, not, not all third world countries, but certainly many Asian countries, Southeast Asian countries, even some South Asian countries, capital has flown in. Therefore, neoliberalism, in one sense, implies, mind you, that time, in the colonial period also, there were no barriers to the flow of capital. It's just that capital decided not to flow into this colony. So, so what neoliberalism has done is to reinstitute a kind of economic regime which is reminiscent of the pre-independence days on the promise that the same institutional regime now would give you better results. Thank you, Professor Patnik, for this answer. Uh, Tejendra, please ask your question. Yeah, thank you very much for an interesting talk. Uh, uh, I, I had a one question that how do you see that the uh, current government modalities, which you referring as a fascist government regime, uh, has some similarities with past one or the current, um, like uh, with the Najis? So how one can uh, map out those modalities? Well, OK, thank you. OK, I think one basic difference between all, and I'm not just talking on one country. I'm, I'm talking about this as a phenomenon. We have to see it as a global phenomenon. As I mentioned, there are lots of countries in which you actually have regimes, which I call neo-fascist, because they're not exactly comparable to the regimes at that time. They, they, they arise out of a conjuncture 
that is similar to the conjuncture that time. That time you had the Great Depression, now you have the dead end of neoliberalism. And likewise, all those features I, 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 I mentioned, authoritarianism, close relationship between the, the fascist elements and big bourgeoisie, the fact that you know uh, uh, repression is not just through the state agencies, but also through all kinds of vigilante groups and so on. Um, and the fact, above all, that a particular minority is targeted and contributes to a change of discourse. In, in other words, the change of discourse. Now, this is something, all of this is familiar. But, the, but, but there are important differences. One important difference which I mentioned is the fact that unlike in that period, contemporary neo-fascism can do very little by way of overcoming the crisis of neoliberalism. You see, there, the, as I said, Hitler, Germany, or uh, the, the, the military fascist Japan overcame unemployment. Therefore, there was a period during let's say 1933 to 1939, when the war uh, was, was unleashed, during which the Nazis were quite popular actually, because they had overcome unemployment and the horrors of the war had not visited Germany. So that kind of even overcoming of the crisis is something which is not possible for contemporary neo-fascism because the fact that we have a nation state confronting globalized finance is something that is not overcome if you have a neo-fascist government and no neo-fascist government has is, is dreams of uh, delinking from from this globalized finance because they are based upon the support and sustenance of the big bourgeoisie that is integrated with globalized finance that itself is global you, you just, just look at Indian big capital that's going all over, that's investing in Australia, that does not want to be linked from this process of globalization. So no neo-fascist regime is delinking from this process and therefore it is not in a position to resolve the crisis. And the second very important feature from our point of view is that neo-fascism operates within a shell of democracy. In other words, it's, it's not as if the democratic government, I mean, the democratic form, the, 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 the democratic uh, shell or the democratic accoutrement is, is completely overthrown. That does not happen, which had happened in that particular period. But that is something which, which does not happen in the contemporary situation but because of these changes and you know one has to recognize that the conjuncture that produced the crisis of great depression is quite different from the conjuncture that produces the crisis of neoliberalism because neoliberalism itself is a new phenomenon and so on which is why i i i have to use the term neo-fascism i'm not i'm not kind of, i'm distinguishing it between classical fascism and this thank you uh Shahid, please ask your question. Please, uh, you are muted. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Mm -hmm. Good evening. First of all, I would like to thank you and congratulate you for such a wonderful uh, discussion. Now, sir, my question is that uh, now, as you said, that this uh, this neoliberalism has already reached its dead end. But somehow, because of uh, this nexus between oligarchs and uh, the uh, fascist regimes, the, between the fascist regimes, it is somehow surviving. Now, my question is that: What is the? My question has basically two parts. What is the way out from from such a scenario? Second part is that: Let's assume for a minute that somehow we are able to delink from the global finance. We are able to deal in from the global finance. Then, what sort of economic system will the nation states be having if we are in a position to deal in from the global finance? Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you very much. Very, very important questions. Okay, you, you see, let me first give you the one scenario, then I'll try and give you the other one. The one scenario is that suppose you take a country, neo fascists are in power. They are carrying on neoliberal uh, policies and so on. And suppose they actually 
are thrown out of power. Suppose they are thrown out of power. And suppose another formation, which is liberal, in, in other words, which is, which is not kind of fascist, uh, comes into power. If they pursue the same neoliberal policies, then unemployment would continue, then distress would continue, and people would get disillusioned with them in no time, because they would have done very little to remove the basic problems that actually the people were facing. And unless you provide jobs to the people, unless you provide, uh, uh, you know, food to the people, unless you provide, uh, you know, I mean, unless you control inflation and so on, uh, they would just throw you out. So, so getting rid of the neo-fascist political formation is not enough because even if a liberal political formation comes to power, unless it pursues different economic policies, which actually bring relief to the people and give rise to an alternative trajectory of, of development, these fellows will come back again because you know they they, they, they have lost kind of you know popularity and, and and would come back again. Therefore, to overcome neo-fascism, that's what I was trying to say, it becomes important to actually provide relief to the people to pursue an alternative trajectory that does not create these growing differences between between the surplus earners and the ordinary people. That means to pursue a trajectory of development that is quite different, quite distinct from neoliberalism. Okay. Now, what is the trajectory of development? Now, that trajectory of development as well as my... Okay, I will tell you, I'll give answer to that in two bits. One answer is what should be the modus operandi. You know, I mean, kind of what kind of things we should have on the agenda. And the other is what should be the substantive difference. The substantive difference to my mind would have to be that the country's development has to be stimulated by the growth of its domestic market, not the growth of its export market. The fundamental determinant of the domestic market in India is the agricultural sector. So you have to have a stimulation of agricultural growth. You have to put purchasing power in the hands of the people, which means agricultural laborers, peasants, and so on. And purchasing power also would mean that you get rid of the very large landlords or the very large landowning class and distribute land to the agricultural they or, or to, to, to the landless. But fundamentally, it will have to be based upon Prosperity in the countryside. Prosperity in the countryside would expand the domestic market. If it expands the domestic market, then you can have industrialization, which is catering to that domestic market. That industrialization would not be uh, industrialization, which is highly, uh, you know, that industrialization would be highly employment intensive, it will absorb the employment from the from the countryside and so on. Therefore, that will set up a virtuous cycle with greater equality, greater, greater decentralization, and of course, based on an expansion of the domestic market, which basically means of the agricultural sector, of peasant agriculture. Now, how do we, but, but what should be the modus operandi? I would say, the modus operandi would be that just as in the Indian constitution, you have a set of fundamental political rights, we have to have a constitutional change so that people universally enjoy a set of fundamental economic rights. In the fundamental economic rights, I would include, and mind you, this is not, this is not some government being kind that, okay, I mean, we are very good, we have given you this, we have given you that. This should be a constitutional right of everybody, a constitutional right to food, to employment, failing which the person should get a, a, a wage, a constitutional right to free education, free quality education, at least up to the higher secondary level, a constitutional right through a national health service to free public health for everybody 
and of course the constitutional right for uh, old age pension, living pension uh, and disability benefits and so on. At least I have thought in terms of the five fundamental economic rights, you can add to them, but, but I would not like the benefits to be given to the people to be charity, to be, as it were, largest on the part of a government that says, ah, you know, we have given you this. No, it should be a fundamental right of the citizen that is written into the constitution, and that is justiciable. In other words, the citizen can take the state to the court if the citizen is unemployed. I think that is the mechanism through which we, 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 we introduce this, but of course the economic trajectory would be different as I mentioned. Thank you, Professor Patni. Uh, Suresh, <coughs> I can see you have raised your hand. Please, if you can ask your yes. question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, my question is very simple. So, like uh, this, like we are in a 21st century where we are talking about corporates, we are talking about capitalists, and so on and so forth. So I have just three simple instances. Uh, so one is with respect to the access to credit. So where the, for example, a farmer in a rural India will get at least, even though so much difficulty, he will get 5,000 and 10,000. For that, the bank or financial institution will send so many legal notices, so many things, and so on and so forth. But other side, corporates are taking, capitalists are taking so much of crores and crores, and their, their loans were waived off, and they are just running out of the country. That is one instance. And the second instance is like, uh, people in rural India, they don't have access to health, healthcare facilities or basic health facilities. But other side, uh, if you see that there will be so much of corporate hospitals, uh, even the government giving some insurance uh, facilities, uh, the basic uh, healthcare, like the regular healthcare facility, regular health checkups that are not comes under the insurance uh, schemes. That is another one. And another important one, uh, you are talking about these state support programs, uh, like uh, midday meals programs, so on and so forth. So in case of midday meals, so access to nutritional food to the students. So here, when, for example, in a villages or so on, uh, people cooking from Dalits or so on, there will be issues, issues comes up. Uh, but uh, like Akshay Patra, uh, it's an NGO run by ISKCON and uh, uh, big, big, uh, big, big people. And, uh, and then they're not giving a healthy put in the sense like uh, giving a egg is also a, a problematic for them. So in this type of situation, so where we are heading towards is the government role is there or just government is supporting or catering facilitating only the car corporates and capitalists i don't know my question is very big uh, no, no, i'm just confused your your question is clear but you see that is exactly what a neoliberal regime does a neoliberal regime is one in which the corporates are left with look i mean you know that, that the corporates are expected to do things that the government abdicates its responsibilities to the corporates. In fact, you just look at every sphere which you have given examples of. Education, for instance. Okay. Now, there is, there is a starving of funds as far as the government universities are concerned. But on the other hand, the corporate universities, private corporate universities around Delhi, there are lots of them which have come up. They, they have enormous access to funds. Similarly, you look at healthcare. I mean, you yourself. Now, public, excellent public institutions, like the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, you know, they are starved of funds. But on the other hand, you have private, corporate uh, healthcare institutions coming up. Now, that is the essence of neoliberalism. I mean, that's exactly what neoliberalism does, because neoliberalism, this is exactly what globalized finance is happy with. And this is, in fact, neoliberalism not only hands over healthcare, education, essential services to the corporate sector, it was even trying to hand over 
peasant agriculture to the corporate sector, which is why the peasants went on a on a year's kind of struggle. So that is what neoliberalism does. My idea is just to not not just oppose to 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 reverse that, to reverse that by having a national health service. Okay, I'll, I'll take the three examples you gave. You, you know, the national health service, uh, Britain has one, Scandinavian countries have one, Soviet Union had a very comprehensive national health service where the state provides free health care to everybody in society. And this is their right as, as citizens. And the state does it, okay. so. Uh, it's not it's not insurance in other words it's insurance is actually a federal insurance is a way of putting money in the hands of the insurance companies uh, but but on the other i mean you know private insurance companies but it is not insurance it is actually government providing free health care to all similarly you talked about uh, food, food, and you know, uh, midday meal and so on. Similarly, midday meal. Why should it be handed over to anybody? This is something which should be done together with, of course, the children's parents uh, in the schools themselves, and un under the supervision of, under the un under the aegis of the government. Similarly, you talk about, uh, you know, credit. Yes, exactly. One of the one of the great achievements that India had after bank nationalization is that, you know, I mean, a cycle rickshaw would be traveling down a road in, 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 in some, some of a still town, but behind the rickshaw would be written, hypothecated to the State Bank of India. That means that rickshaw puller had actually got credit from the State Bank of India to buy the rickshaw which he was actually driving. So credit was reached to large numbers of ordinary people, which never happens under capitalism. Okay, so it's a remarkable achievement. But on the other hand, as a matter of fact, if you look, I mean, I have looked at some internal Reserve Bank of India figures, which are not openly available. If you look at the proportion of institutional credit, bank credit going to the agricultural sector, that proportion keeps rising, rising, rising till the end of the 1980s after that it comes down. Uh, I mean, this is the truth. They show all kinds of kind of agricultural credit. They show, as I said, if you buy a, a car in a village that's shown as agricultural credit, but genuine agricultural credit as a proportion of total bank credit has come down in the neoliberal period. The peasants, therefore, have been forced to go to all these blade companies and things of that kind, which are the new class of private money lenders. Now, that again is a feature of neoliberalism. You have no idea the kind of pressure. In fact, a governor of the Reserve Bank once told me, former governor, you have no idea the kind of pressure that had been exerted by US Treasury officials on him and of course on generally the Indian government for privatizing the banking system. Their argument was that, okay, you don't want to privatize the entire banking system, at least privatize the State Bank of India. And why should you do that? In order to raise the confidence of the investors. Okay, so, so the point is that, you know, the features you are talking about are features which are necessary components of a neoliberal vision. Thank you once again. Uh, I have a question actually. You touched a little yeah. bit. It's about the some capitalism itself. Uh, oh, okay. I, I, I missed that. Can you please repeat Sorry. it? Uh, it's, it's about some, some of the peculiarities within the capitalism. For example, the Scandinavian yeah. welfare state or the yeah, Britain, yeah. which is high, and the London and, uh, is one of the centers of financial capital. And there we have the NHS. And Canada is also highly connected. And I mean, it seems contradictory that um, I hesitate to use the word, but the capital is somehow accepting or digesting this kind of social protection measure existing where they don't, of course, they don't like it. 
I mean, if if we are to believe what is happening in the global south and how capital behave in global south, they are accepting that. So, have you have you thought about it? Yeah, you 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 see, none of the welfare state measures has been enacted, implemented during the period of neoliberalism. Okay, this occurred in the immediate post-war years when capitalism itself was witnessing substantial state intervention in demand management, very high wealth tax rates. Now, those that is a regime which now is being very slowly dismantled, but there's so much public opposition to dismantling that it has not been rapid enough. But, 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 but for instance, in Scandinavian countries, the welfare state measures are being slowly dismantled during the neoliberal period. So I would put it this way, that the immediate post-war capitalist epoch was one in which capitalism, firstly, capitalism had emerged from the war greatly weakened. Secondly, there had been the, the, the enormous expansion of, of the Soviet Union into Eastern Europe and the Chinese Revolution and so on. There was a very serious social history. So there was an existential crisis for capitalism during which all kinds of measures were, were enacted even under capitalism by social democracy. I mean, it's not a conservative government that, that, that introduced national service, the Labour government did. Uh, and, 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 and so that was a particular conjuncture. But with the re-establishment, reassertion of capitalism, which occurs in particular with the neoliberal regime becoming globalized, uh, finance becoming globalized, you actually have an effort to roll back some of those measures. The efforts have not succeeded. Those countries still continue to be welfare states, but on the other hand, to some extent, they are not as welfare states today as they were at the at the height of the post-war welfare statism. Thank you. Uh, any more questions, please uh, raise your hand uh, and ask your question, if you have. I know, yes, uh, Finner, uh, if I'm pronouncing correctly, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much for organization and thank you, Professor Patrick, um, very much. Um, I want to ask uh, that, we talked about the uh, uh, global conjuncture uh, about uh, globalization of finance capital, but I wonder, uh, can we talk about any domestic um, dynamics of, uh, if we say so, financialization uh, in India? Um, I actually um, wonder, Ring, uh, who are benefiting from uh, this change in the form of the state in India? Uh, can we yes. talk about? Uh, yes, certainly. Thank you very much. Uh, a very substantial, mind you, a, a fairly substantial population, share of the population, is actually a beneficiary of globalization. It consists, of course, of the big capitalists that we know, the Ambani's, the Adani's, and so on, who have gone global. I mean, you know, now, now their names are among the 10 richest in the world, and so on. And, you know, they are investing in, in, in Australia. They are, they are investing in Europe. Uh, in fact, the Tatas were investing in, in, in Europe. So the Indian big capital, has now gone global. The Indian big capital is closely integrated, therefore, as that's the word I use, with globalized finance capital. Okay, uh, it does not have any interests which are distinct from the interests of globalized finance capital. Its agenda is the same as the agenda of globalized finance capital. Uh, the second, more more important is the fact that you know there is a substantial segment of the middle class that actually is a beneficiary of this globalization now this segment of the middle class 
you know, let us say activities which have been relocated from the advanced countries to here, like for instance, call centers and so on, you know, uh, it has expanded job opportunities for this segment of the middle class, okay. I said overall unemployment has become worse, but on the other hand, for this segment of the working class, job opportunities have actually increased. Now, similarly, uh, let us say, I mean, you know, you 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 find now uh, people of Indian origin, basically, let's say, middle class families are now producing children, some of whom are executives in big multinational companies. Okay, middle class children are executives or, or you know, have jobs in, in the United States. Almost every, I mean, almost every middle class Bengali family, or why, why Bengali? I mean, you know, when I said Bengali, people said, why only Bengal? Almost every middle class Indian family has got some child or the other who is. Uh, in the United States, and, and 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 therefore they have a vested interest in in not delinking from a process of globalization because delinking would entail, in some sense, looking inwards would 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 entail putting restrictions on the flow of goods, finance, and so on and so forth. So so they have an interest in maintaining the global the regime of globalization or the neoliberal regime because they have done well. I mentioned that the share of surplus in output has increased. Now, who gets this surplus? Obviously, not only the Ambani's and the Adani's, but they have a large army of people who are their managers, who are their executives, and so on, who are all doing pretty well. So, so the point is that it is a very significant middle class segment that is a supporter of the neoliberal regime. And I think what all this amounts to is the following. When we look at the anti-colonial struggle before independence, the anti-colonial struggle was a multi-class struggle. Okay, there were workers in it, there were peasants in it, there were kind of agricultural laborers in it, there was the middle class in it, there were uh, there were also the capitalists in it because the Indian capitalists had got cornered because colonialism did not give them enough opportunities to, to, to grow. Uh, okay, so, so the point is, I mean, they were not protected. Some protection came during the interwar period, 1925, but on the other hand, that's very limited. So uh, their ambitions were thwarted. So they also joined the anti-colonial struggle. So the anti-colonial struggle was a multi-class struggle. But now what has happened with neoliberalism is that there is a rupture in this front that had been a part of the anti-colonial struggle. Now what you have is that the big business, the, the, a, a segment of the middle class has gone over to the other side, while the workers, the peasants, the agricultural laborers, the, 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 the kind of you know, craftsmen, the fishermen, the washermen and so on, are, continue to remain where they were. They could, they, and, and their interests are being squeezed and they were originally promised a trickle down that look, let's have a new regime. If we have high growth rate, then you're also going to become beneficiaries. But as I said, that is not the case. Actually poverty, at least defined in nutritional norms is something which has increased over time. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Patnik. Um, now we have a question from Roshan. Roshan, can you ask your question by yourself? Oh no. Okay, he's typing to me. I'm just reading him out, sir. So uh, okay. has the rise of China in global finance made any difference? So it's a kind of different nature of finance. So it's so, yeah. I mean, China as a counter uh, you, you, source yeah. of capital. Yeah, China is not into this process of financial globalization. In China, for instance, you see what happened in India tomorrow. You, tomorrow, if you have a capital flight, a mass, large amounts of 
investment of a financial investment which has occurred let's say in the indian stock market they would simply sell it and 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 take the money out in china that is not the case in china if you have a portfolio investment in that country suppose you are a kind of you you are an american company or an american institution that has invested in the chinese stock market then if you want to take money out then you would be able to sell only to some other foreign company institution you cannot sell it to local chinese and take money out okay so so in that sense there can never be a capital outflow because you see if you have invested 100 dollars here you wish to take out 100 dollars then you can you have to sell it to somebody who in turn is bringing in 100 dollars to buy your thing okay so so you can never have a capital flight from china and and that is that is a very different arrangement that kind of arrangement ensure that china is not a part of financial globalization the way that the rest of the third world including india is am i making myself clear yes just just uh, i mean roshan didn't ask me just my own curiosity is that why did they allow it to happen it it sounds like a little bit like capital control but why they allowed china yes, to is, it, uh, it it is capital control it is absolutely capital control uh, because you are not allowing capital to flow out of the country because because if anyone wants to take capital out then there must be somebody else who's bringing in bringing in capital okay so uh, it is actually capital control and and you know i mean this is because the chinese resisted pressure to open up their economy to globalized finance i mean we did not resist that pressure rest of the third world did not resist that pressure but the chinese did resist that pressure thank you thank you very much anyone else i have a question on caste and <laughs> new liberalism but uh anyone else if you have a question please ask uh okay maybe i ask um, i think we go uh, now so yes that... anisha please finally <laughs> too much background noise so i had to wait until that sort of mellowed down uh all right uh, professor i had this one question that i was curious about you see today capital is very strongly correlated with technology we cannot keep technology out of the entire equation in macroeconomics today we know that capital comes in there is like this boom of technology you want to be part of the frontier for any developing economy how do you sort of try to disintegrate bring out this technological debate from this neoliberalism this flow of capital so on so you know i i am in favor of the selective introduction of frontier technology okay in fact you will be surprised to know that the cubans the cubans have developed a therapy come uh, uh you know uh, preventive medicine for lung cancer the cubans you know in 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 other words there there are areas where we have to develop our own technology we have to develop technology for mankind so i am not a person who is actually saying that we should not use modern technology or we should not develop modern technology but i'm opposed to the introduction of modern technology across the board i do not see why for instance we should have let us say a mall which displaces thousands of traders okay so so the point is but i do see the need for having modern technology in 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 medicine so 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 the thing is that you know i'm all for a selective introduction of modern technology and but not for modern technology across the board that generates unemployment okay the 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 real problem with technology is that it generates unemployment i mean it's, it's as simple as that because technology means high rate of labor productivity growth 
and that basically means low rate of employment growth. That basically means uh, if your workforce growth is greater, then of course people are going to remain unemployed. So you could you have to have some control and technology. On the other hand, of course, if you have a socialist economy, in that case, you can double labor productivity, but of course reduce working hours so that people have more leisure. But but that is something which which would require a. Uh, uh, a, a, a kind of degree of achievement, you know, which is which is much beyond where we currently are. You see, what happens? I mean, you know, suppose labor productivity doubles. With a doubling of labor productivity, let's say across the board, there's a doubling of uh, labor productivity. This can have different outcomes. As I said, in a socialist economy, you can do two things. You can actually uh, double the real wages that produce twice as much, employing everybody. Or alternatively, you can produce the same amount, have the same real wage, but reduce work hours by 50%. Am I making myself clear? But typically what would happen in a capitalist economy is that is, is that you would actually reduce the number of employed persons because there's a pressure of unemployment, people would be getting the same real wage because this is a huge army of unemployed hanging around because of technological change. And the benefit of technological change because of the fact that labor productivity has doubled would accrue to the capitalists in the form of surplus. So, so you have to look at the social setting in which technological change is introduced. Okay, if there is no more questions, please ask. Otherwise, I will ask the last question, maybe, for the recorded session. Yes, the question is, did uh, neoliberal uh, finance co has complicated, uh, has complicated uh, caste system further in India? You know, there are certain very, okay, before I answer that, I want to just underline one thing. I was talking about a set of fundamental economic rights. These fundamental economic rights are universal. They are rights of citizenship and they are justiciable. In other words, what do we have now? We, we, we have, let's say, some rights which are available to, let's say, OBCs, or you know some 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 benefits available to OBCs, SCSTs, and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, therefore, other castes would like to be categorized as OBCs and so on. You know, I mean, charts would like to say that we are OBCs and so on in order to access those kinds of benefits. Now, these are basically targeted, selected benefits. I believe the way of overcoming this is to actually have universal benefits which accrue to everybody, not because they belong to a particular caste, but because they are citizens of the Indian Republic. That's why I'm talking about fundamental economic rights. And, and, and we can easily finance these fundamental economic rights. I've actually uh, done some work on it and, 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 and written a couple of papers on it uh, by having an appropriate wealth tax and an inheritance tax only on the top 1% of the population. Okay, what has neoliberalism done? You see what neoliberalism has done is actually, it has rolled back even the kind of benefits which was coming in the way of, uh, uh, you know, uh, SCSTs or OBCs and so on. Why? Because you look at job reservations. There are no reservations in the private sector. Since neoliberalism entails privatization of public sector units, let's say privatization of public sector banks, that basically means that some benefits which are available to the OBCs or to the SCSTs earlier are no longer available. They would have got a certain percent of, 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 of reservation in jobs if the banks were publicly owned. But if you privatize the banks, then, then in fact, effectively that is gone. They can be thrown out. They have no, no right to any, any reservation. So privatization, which is a very important component of neoliberalism, implies a rolling back of some of the benefits that are that put to them. Likewise, you look at education. If you have private education, 
then I mean private education institutions, then then they 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 necessarily exclude the poor and the the SCSTs or the OBCs and so are concentrated among the poor. So so they, they get excluded from the education system. Likewise, they get excluded from the healthcare system. Or if they don't get excluded, they may get included, but in the process, you go and sell your land, you go and sell your homestead in order to finance the hospital bill. Delhi is full of newspaper reports about some uh, uh, some some family, some couple from UP, which actually brought their sick child to Delhi. They were in, in one of these hospitals for 19 days. Uh, but on the other hand, they their child died, and in order to meet the hospital bill, they had to sell off their land back. So these are tragic, horrendous cases, and neoliberalism has meant a proliferation of these kinds of cases because it has made healthcare more expensive, infinitely more expensive, education infinitely more expensive than they were earlier. And the whole idea, therefore, should be to make them free under the aegis of the state uh, in a new, new order. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, we have received two more questions, if you have time, sir. Um, so one is uh, um, Patrick actually asked first. Patrick, would you like to ask by yourself? It's always better if you ask by yourself. Patrick? Okay. Okay, I will read it out then. Uh, can, we, can we see new opportunities to counterbalance neoliberalism to the right uh, to BRICS or similar regional association? Yes, I, I, I think, well, I mean, if you're thinking of a world beyond neoliberalism, in other words, now we're not talking about India, we're talking of a world beyond neoliberalism. In that case, it is obvious that I think there have to be regional associations of countries uh, which then help one another. You see, India is a large country. India virtually can produce every commodity we need other than oil. And for oil, we can have a bilateral agreement with, with Iran or with Russia or something. But, but lots of African countries are small countries. And therefore, they cannot just be linked uh, and, and, and hope to be self-reliant. They have to be part of a broader union of states uh, or, 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 I mean, like the European Union, you have to have among them uh, greater unity. So there has to be greater unity of small states so that they can actually uh, de-link from this globalization phenomenon. That there's no doubt at all about that. In fact, I, I, I think even, even small states linking up with big states, but with sufficient safeguards so that they are not kind of trodden upon, squeezed by the big state, uh, would probably be the order of, of, of the future. Thank you. Now the last question, uh, sorry for my pronunciation, uh, pronunciation, uh, Benazir? Yes, uh, my name is Ebenezer. Yes, Ebenezer. Um, yeah, so my, my question has to do with something on uh, climate. I, I don't know whether I, I'm audible enough. Am I audible now? Yes, 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 of course. Yes. yes. Yeah, so, um, so my my question has to do with um with uh, something on climate. Um, I've also read Prof's um article on uh, concepts of primitive accumulation, where he was able to uh, label or give out some characteristics of um, neoliberal regimes. I want to know how to situate um issues of global financing on climate. In 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 neoliberal um, in neoliberal uh, regimes, if if well, my question know, is clear, no no no, it, fine. You see, I mean, climate change is a real pressing issue as, as far as mankind is concerned. But in my view, it is impossible to tackle climate change within the confines of capitalism. Because you know, I mean, and, and, and capitalism now is neoliberal capitalism. See, because because suppose you're talking in terms of, in fact, you know, I mean, I've just had come to my conference where someone was was producing this. That suppose we are talking in terms 
of meeting certain targets. Now, those targets uh, can be met only if there's a reduction, only if there's an actual reduction in emissions, let us say, in the global north. But the point is that global north is, that would basically mean a reduction in the range of capitalist activity in the global north. Now, global north is not going to agree to that. What they would instead say is that, look, we are going to bribe you. We'll give you money. You give us some of your carbon credits. You give us some of the things that you might be entitled to. But, but that is, tip, you, you see, so the point of capitalism would be to commoditize, to, to, to make a commodity out of the various kind of, you know, uh, carbon credits and such like things, rather than to undertake actual reductions in it, let alone reductions, even a freeze on it. In, in other words, just, just freeze, you know, because capitalism cannot do without accumulation. Accumulation means growth. And if there's growth in that case, I mean, when capitalism does without accumulation, it's in a crisis. But capitalism cannot do without accumulation. If it is accumulating, then of course there's growth. If there's growth, then there is necessarily greater encroachment on nature. Okay. So so it is it is it is kind of just impossible for mankind to cope with the climate crisis within the confines of capitalism. This is an issue which, you know, I mean, for instance, this was this was argued by Evo Morales some time ago, you know, the Bolivian leader. Uh, but I completely agree with what Evo Morales was saying, and I think we have to really uh, take that into account. So all this talk about climate change is very good because it, it makes makes everybody conscious of it. But on the other hand, to talk of climate change within this confines of capitalism is something which really uh, makes no sense as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, uh, Professor Patnik, for this uh, wonderful lecture and uh, giving us time for this question answer session. Now, I would like to ask Anisha to formally end the session. Thank our speaker. After that, uh, okay, we will have 10 more minutes when you can ask freely question. We will not record that part. Thank you, Professor Patnik. Anisha. All right. So uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Professor Patnik, for being part of our webinar series. We're truly grateful and honored. Thank you to all the participants and the co-organizers of the YSI South Asia Working Group to have made this possible. Uh, we will now formally end the session for today and see you all on the other side of the informal session.